We're going to get started in three or four minutes, folks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us here in this glorious outdoor sanctuary. 
going to start by lighting the light this morning. So I'm going to do that really quick. So give me just a moment. As we get started, let's uh, get a few announcements out of the way. I said this last week, but I'm just saying it again for folks that may be tuning in online, or for those of you who may not been have been here last week, we're starting up a, a new children's, a fall children's program. Last uh, fall, we did the Apostles' Creed, and uh, this fall, we're going to be looking at the Ten Commandments and talking about how those commandments relate to Christ and point to Christ and reveal to us our need for Jesus. Those of you who have young children, be on the lookout for weekly emails. And we've got some really exciting crafts and games that we'll be sending out via email and some lessons for the families. Uh, so even though we aren't able to be together maybe as we normally would or, or desire, we're trying to remain connected and new creative ways like this so uh, so be on the lookout for for those emails those of you with young children if you maybe have young children and want to be on that list and haven't received an email yet um, please let me know and or, or Megan my wife and um, and we'll be sure to get you on the list so thank you also we're working on a plan to start meeting indoors at some point um, obviously again as I said last week uh, this is Vermont, and uh, the, the weather is already changing, and uh, some of you I see out there have uh, blankets and sweaters, and that's great, um, but, you know, we can't do this forever, so we're hoping, and maybe not next week, maybe the next, that we'll start meeting indoors, so the last Sunday right now is what we're shooting for, the deacons are going to talk about it uh, this coming uh, Tuesday a little bit, so uh, so not promising anything at this point but that's the tentative plan is maybe in a couple of weeks we'll start trying to meet in, inside the church so um, so thank you for being patient and gracious with us as we navigate these tricky tricky waters one other thing that I wanted to do this morning I wish I'd have done this for the last few weeks but we've been together um, there's a lot running through this brain these days and as I don't remember everything um, but when we used to gather in the church in the bulletin, I would do like little ministry highlights. Maybe some of you remember that. I would have a focus on a particular ministry or something that a person was doing that maybe not everyone knew about. Maybe some of the things everyone knew about, but some of them certainly not. And so I just want to do that um, again and just say thanks to folks. I mean, there's so many people to say thank you to. Um, but I was at the food shelf uh, a couple of weeks ago working with, with uh, some folks here and just kind of seeing what was going on, and I'm just reminded of how much these people do, and so I'm just going to put a slideshow up here. It's not a slideshow, it's just a slide. Um, I have some folks that help at the food show. This is not everybody by any means. <laughs> you might not be able to see it great. Um, just a snapshot of some folks that are, are here early um, on Thursdays and, and several other days of the week volunteering and serving our community. So I just want to say thanks to those folks. And uh, keep the food shelf in your prayers. There's always needs here for volunteers and for help and support. Um, so anyway, thanks to all of you out there who give and serve uh, for that very important ministry and program. Now I'm going to invite Carol Miller for us. We're going to open with the Word of God. And after hearing the Word, then I'm going to pray. I'm going to switch it up a little bit because this, this scripture is just uh, alive and powerful. And I think it would be really appropriate to read it first and then we'll pray after that. So. It's in Ezekiel 37, uh, verses 1 through 14 is the text. It's right there. Let me do this. There you go, Carol. Thank you. Ezekiel, a very old name. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. 
And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, an exceedingly straight, large army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost, and we are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves. O my people, and I will put my spirit upon you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Thank you for that reading, Carol. That's our prayer, isn't it, today, is that these dry bones would come to life. We know that's a supernatural work of God. It's not something that, that we can do. We pray that the Lord, as he speaks to us today and as we worship, that uh, we would experience that new life that is spoken of there in Ezekiel. And we know that today that happens through the preaching of the gospel, that it's through the good news about Jesus that dead people come to life. And so that's our prayer today, our prayer for folks that are watching online, that whoever hears these words would experience that new resurrected life of Jesus. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray now, open our service with prayer, and if you would, uh, join with me as we pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we give you thanks as we come before you in worship this morning. We recognize your goodness and your kindness to us, and we give you glory for all your kindness and goodness. We give thanks for your manifold gifts and blessings to us unworthy servants. And we invite you to come and move in our midst this morning, and we humbly acknowledge once again that we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have transgressed your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. We have done those things which we ought not to have done. But you, O oh Lord, have shown mercy to us. We pray that you would spare those who confess their faults and restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to us this morning even in the gospel and grant, O oh, most merciful and kind Father, for Jesus' sake, that these dry bones this morning might live 
that as you speak to us again this morning, that new life might emerge out of the valley of bones, and that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name, we pray. Amen. Now I'll invite Jim and Carol Proctor forwards to lead us in a song together. We're going to be singing a very famous old hymn that many of you will know. It's called, What Can Wash Away My Sin? And what's the answer? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? <laughs> so we'll start with that this morning. There was a day centuries ago when folks came into church and, and there was something new there. And some sputtered and fumed. They brought in instruments that had never been in church before, straight from the bars. <laughs> it was a pipe organ. And someday, about 150 years ago, they used that dreaded instrument, and they sang one of those new songs, them newfangled songs, and some folks sputtered, and they said, you know, I like the old songs. And that new song was, What Can Wash Away My Sin? <laughs> Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. That was a brand new praise song 150 years ago. You know, styles come and go. Instruments come and go. But this is eternal. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. But the blood of Jesus. For oh, my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For oh, my cleansing, this I plead. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, no, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can force in a tone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not a But the blood of Jesus, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, no, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, no. Nothing but the blood of invite Kathy Roloff Forrest to share with us a children's message. Thank you, Kathy. Good 
wow, there's not as many of us, but everybody looks warm or cold. I'm not sure. Um, when I was a kid, I was raised going to church, and I really knew the difference between good and bad. There was a very strict moral code in my family that I'm very grateful for my parents passing on to us. But, being a child, I spent a lot of my life in another land. I don't know what it was. Um, <laughs> I, was I was always making up stories and not paying attention and daydreaming a lot. <clears throat> And so, oftentimes I would get in trouble because it was time to do dishes or chores and I was hidden behind the couch because it was a little nook I could get in reading a book that I just couldn't put down, you know. Or we would be doing dishes and I'd be doing the silverware and suddenly I was sword fighting with a fork with someone, one of my siblings that didn't have a fork and... I would stab them, and anyway, that would get me into trouble. I spent a lot of time getting into trouble. Um, and then there was that times when my dad, he would do the grocery shopping, and he would take two of us at a time. You don't take nine children grocery shopping. Um, and I would beg and beg to push the shopping cart, big metal shopping cart. And he would always say, Kathy, you always run up my legs. And, and I would say, this time I won't, Dad. I really, you know, I'm not. I'm going to pay attention. So inevitably he would give in because he was kind and I would run up his legs. And so, um, <laughs> so I didn't get to do that very often. So what was, what my purpose in life was is I was always trying really hard to be good and not doing a very good job at it. And there's a saying by C.S. Lewis that says, nobody knows how bad they are until they try really hard to be good. That's been the story of my life. Trying really hard to be good and going, yeah, I didn't do it again. So when I was a teenager and I had heard the gospel, somehow it dropped. I got it. And what I got... This is always hard for me because <laughs> I always lose it here. Is what I got was the forgiveness of God for me. And it profoundly changed me. I was not the same person at 16 and a half that I had been the day before. I was not the same person. And that was because I realized that I was loved just the way I was daydreaming, running up the back of people's legs, crazy person that I was. So I was loved for who I was, but more importantly, I was forgiven for the things that I did wrong. And I have to say, that core of the gospel, if you take that, and we preach that all the time here, I talk to kids all the time about the love of God for them. If you take that into your heart, you will be changed. You don't have to do anything you will be changed because that forgiveness works in you. And once you know that God forgives you, you can forgive yourself. And we all need that. We need to forgive ourselves for the wrong things that we have done, um, for the follies of our youth, for the mistakes we continue to make today. Um, we can also ask other people for forgiveness because we know what it's like to need that and a big thing is we can forgive others so this great gift that we have in Jesus Christ this great gift of forgiveness will change your life forever and will continue to change you until the day that we meet him in glory thank you going to continue to use responsive prayer today, but I took uh, today's prayers partly from the Great Litany, which is found in the Book of Common Prayer, to be our guide today. So the first response is, have mercy upon us. 
O God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, by whose will we live, have mercy upon us. O God the Son, redeemer of the world, by whose love we live forever, have mercy upon us. O God the Holy Spirit, sanctifier of the faithful, by whose presence we inherit eternity, have mercy upon us. O holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, one God, remaining ever the same and unchanging in your compassion and grace, have mercy upon us. O Lord, do not remember our sins or justly reward us according to the choice that we make to turn away from you. Forgive us and restore us, good Lord. Restore your people whom you have redeemed through your Son and keep us forever in your hand. Have mercy upon us. The next response is, Good Lord, deliver us. From every evil, from willful sin, from the attacks and assaults of the devil, and from everlasting damnation, Good Lord, deliver us. From hardness of our hearts, from pride, from self-centeredness and hypocrisy, from envy and hatred and anger, and from every lack of love, Good Lord, deliver us. From wrong affections that turn us from you and from all the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil, good Lord, deliver us. From every false doctrine, heresy, and separation from our brothers and sisters, from taking lightly your word and commandment, good Lord, deliver us. From the pandemic that now grips our world, good Lord, deliver us. The next response is, hear us, good Lord. We pray that you would hear us today, that you would uphold your holy church and keep her in the right way. Hear us, good Lord. Give your light to our pastor, our elders, our deacons. Fill them with true knowledge and understanding of your will for us today. Hear us, good Lord. Let your blessing and keeping rest upon all of your people. Hear us, good Lord. Send us out as laborers into your field, and through our witness and faith, let us draw many to your Son, Jesus. Hear us, good Lord. Be faithful to our families, to our children, to our neighbors, and bring them to a saving knowledge of your grace and provision. Hear us, good Lord. Rule over our nation and the hearts of our elected officials and all that are in authority that they may do justice and love mercy and walk in the ways of truth. Hear us, good Lord. Show your pity and compassion upon those that are imprisoned and held captive, the homeless and the hungry, those that are addicted and oppressed, and all who are alone or are in need of help. Hear us, good Lord. Son of God, today we cry out to you in our need. Hear us, good Lord. O Lamb of God, you alone take away the sins of the world. Let all that we do this day in worship and all that we set our hands to during this week be right in your sight. Believing in your grace, we now pray in your name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, Lord, open our ears to both hear and to take to heart your word today as it is read. Set your anointing on our pastor, Joshua Moore, as he opens your word to us today. Let it be planted deeply into our hearts and let it change us today to more fully walk this week as your people. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Our reading today is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved, 
if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And this is the word of the Lord to us today. Thank you, Kathy, for that heartfelt children's message and rest for your prayers and, and for the reading. I'm still getting used to this. Well, this morning we're going to continue our series titled, What is the Gospel? And the first week we gathered, you may remember that I said uh, that the gospel was for Christians too. Do you remember that, those of you who are here? That it's not the first step in a series of steps on our way to salvation, but that the message of Christ dying for sin is the very message that sustains us throughout our Christian walk. We can't add to it or take away from it. The second week I talked about how the gospel is, is mainly um, about God and not about us. I talked about how God is the one doing and saving and getting the glory and how he is the great reward of the gospel, if you remember that. Then the third week in this series, I expanded on week two, so this would have been last week, and said that the primary gifts given to us in the gospel are not earthly or material gifts. Um, the primary gift is relationship with God. You remember me talking about that last week. The gospel is not good news, I said, because we get stuff. It's good news because we get God. That's what makes it good news. Now today, I'm going to say that the gospel is not self-help. I've already talked about this a little bit in the series, but the gospel is a message about how dead people can be brought to life, and the core of that message is found in our passage today in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This wind really complicates things. So this text that's before us today, Paul uses the word, it's of first importance. And so that should immediately get our attention, right? That, that what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 15 is not of second or third or fourth or tenth importance. It is of first importance. And so let's give special attention to our passage as we think about these things to, today together. Well, Mark Ballard, who is the founding president of the Northeastern Baptist College down in Bennington, Vermont, in his very helpful recent book, What is the Gospel? He writes these words. The gospel is not generic good news. It is a specific kind of news. If your doctor says it's not cancer, if your child says I love you, if the director of the homeless shelter down the road says you provided 900 meals for clients this year, that's good news, right? Those are, are good things, that's good news but it's not the biblical gospel. In the New Testament, this is Mark Ballard writing here, the gospel refers only to the glad tidings of Christ and his salvation. It is the good news of how Jesus conquers our sins and gives eternal life to all who believe in him. End quote. That is the good news. Perhaps the biggest difference between generic good news and the good news about Jesus is that generic good news does not have the power to bring dead people to life. But the gospel of Jesus Christ does. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says these words. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the message, the story that God in his goodness has chosen to use to save men and women from destruction. This stands in complete contrast to self-help. If you were to look up the definition of self-help, you would find something like what's on the board here. The action or process of bettering oneself or overcoming one's problems without the aid of others. Sometimes people might include others in the process somehow when they're trying to improve themselves. But still the overall sense of self-help is that you're taking actions and involving others by your own volition or choice. Doing this and doing that to improve yourself. That's kind of what is self-help is getting at. And that's not bad. That's not wrong to do those things. But it's not the gospel. And it will not save you from your sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can save you from your sins. Because the blood of Christ addresses a very specific problem. A problem that gets at the heart of every other problem. Our estrangement from God. The fact that we, we don't know God and we are, we've rebelled against Him and we are estranged from Him. You see, we were once friends with God. In the beginning, and then we rebelled. We all like sheep that wander off from their shepherd have gone astray. And we've tried to live life without God. And the problem is that we're not made for that, are we? We're not made to live life apart from God. We were made to live in loving relationship with God. And when we are close to God, we thrive. But we rebel. And because we rebelled as people, sin entered the world. And now death has come because sin has come. Death is all around us. And I'm not just talking about physical death, but spiritual death. I know you see it all around you in the world. When we see hate, when we see injustice or strife or greed or lust or murder or violence in war, racism, exploitation, malice, covetousness, lying, deception, all of these things are the fruit of spiritual death. And they're all around us today, are they not? And all of us here, if we're truly honest with ourselves, all of us have committed these crimes. And these crimes are the evidence that we are living apart from God and that we're dead in our sins, that we don't have His life in us. And what is more, because of our, our badness, because of these things, God has judged us and we stand under His just condemnation, just as a criminal in a courtroom would stand under the condemnation of the law and of the judge. Most of us here in the cold uh, northern New England states have been, at one point or another, have been walking on a, on a solid sheet of ice before. Any of y'all, maybe out in your driveway, you've got a little spot there where there was a puddle at one point, and then it's just turned into a, a solid sheet of ice. And you know what that's like to walk across those, right? It's pretty scary, pretty treacherous. You know just how slippery it can be at just the slightest misplacement of your foot or your weight you can completely lose your balance and have a really terrible fall and greatly injure yourself. Well, a famous New England preacher from the early 1700s used this imagery to describe the predicament that we are in because of our sins. He said, all of us, like sheep that have gone astray, like, like sinners that have rebelled against their God, um, we are all like those standing on on an icy, slippery slope. And he writes this, this is him, quote, that the reason why that you and I have not fallen already and do not fall now is only that God's appointed time has not come. For it is said that when that in due time or appointed time comes, their foot shall slide. 
then they shall be left to fall as they are inclined by their own weight. God will not hold them up in these slippery places any longer, but will let them go. And then at that very instant, they shall fall into destruction. And as he that stands on such slippery declining ground on the edge of a pit, he cannot stand alone. When he is let go, he immediately falls and is lost. That's our predicament as people who are condemned under the law of God. We've broken his law. We are standing as if on a slippery slope and it's it's nothing but the mercy of God that holds us up at any moment, this preacher said. Now, this is not the kind of situation that mere self-help can remedy. The power of positive thinking does does nothing for this kind of a predicament because it does not deal with our main problem, does it? The fact that we are spiritually dead and estranged from God and that we stand under His judgment. And let me tell you that religion is not the answer either. You see, some people think of religion in the way that others think of self-help. Religion for some is just about moral improvement. It's just about making yourself a better person. But that doesn't address the core issue of our estrangement from God either, does it? No. No amount of prayer or of church attendance or Bible reading will fix this problem that we're talking about here. What we need is peace with God. We need to be forgiven. We need to have our slate wiped clean. This problem that is between us and God, this estrangement, this transgressions, these transgressions that we've committed, we need those things to be wiped away. We need peace with God. We need a way for our relationship to be healed and for what has been broken to be fixed. Have any of you seen the old baseball movie, The Sandlot? I'm assuming maybe maybe most of you. There's a few out there that haven't. Well, the main character in this movie, or at least one of the main characters, is a, a kid named Smalls. And I'm not going to outline the whole movie for you here, but he makes a really bad choice and takes his dad's baseball out of his nice trophy room that was autographed by Babe Ruth. Right? Babe Ruth, arguably the greatest baseball player in history. And he loses it over a fence. He takes it out and they're playing a pickup game of baseball and he loses it. Someone hits it over the fence playing a pickup game with his friends and they can't get it back because there's this big scary dog on the other side of the fence. Anyway, well, he knows that his dad is not going to be happy with him, right? He's lost this ball that that is almost irreplaceable. He knows that the only way to appease his father's anger and to fix the problem is to get the autographed ball back. That's the only way. This was his father's most treasured possession. I mean, it was priceless. And he's lost it. Mowing the grass or saying that he was sorry or washing the dishes for a few nights was not going to fix the problem. The only way to fix the problem was to give the father back what he had lost. The ball, right? Well, the scriptures tell us that the same is true of our relationship with God the Father. Religion and self-help won't fix the problem because they're not getting at the larger issue, the damage we've done. We've lost something. We've broken something that is of incredible worth. And mere acts of kindness and goodness and religion are not enough to restore what has been lost and broken. Our passage today in 1 Corinthians 15. I'm just going to let the train pass. (laughs) 1 
atrocious. <laughs> try this now. Well, our passage today in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us how we can mend this problem that we've created, how we can mend this rupture in our relationship with God or how it can be mended. Notice in verses 1 and 2 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. That's that's how the ESV renders, renders it. I actually really like the way the New Living Translation captures the meaning of what Paul is saying here. It says this, It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. So so the way that we're saved from this predicament that we're in, this estrangement with God, the way we restore what has been broken is by believing this thing that Paul calls the gospel or good news in verse 1. This thing that's of first importance, which we're going to hear more about in just a moment. Here again, I want to emphasize to you notice that Paul does not give us a laundry list of things that we need to do here. There is but one thing we are to do if we are to be saved, and that is believe the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? Well, that's what we've been talking about for four weeks in a row, right? And I think most Sundays the gospel is preached here at this church in one way or another and preached churches around this country in one way or another. We've been trying to take a little bit of a deeper dive into some of these things the last few weeks. But Paul here in our passage is not going to leave us guessing about what the gospel is. He's not going to leave it up to our imaginations. Paul is going to tell us clearly in verses 3 through 5 what the gospel is. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Here is the message, the good news, which is what gospel means, that we are called to believe if we are to be saved from the punishment that you and I deserve under holy God. Well, how does this work, okay? How does this work? Is this a magic trick of some kind that God wiggles his wand and and something happens and we're saved? How does it work? How is it that Jesus' death and resurrection save us? I mean, of course, there's supernatural realities here and mysteries here, and we can't rationally explain all of this exactly, but we can certainly say some things about it, right? And if we're going to understand how it is that the gospel works, we must first understand something about God. We must understand His goodness, that God is good. You see, God is good and can do nothing evil. It is not in His nature to do anything evil. God cannot lie or sin or perform any evil act. I mean, we can't even imagine that, can we? We can't even conceive of that because you and I would do this on a daily basis, right? We ponder evil things and we do evil things, even if they seem like little things, we're inclined to do them. God is the opposite. He cannot do evil. Everything that God does is pure and right and good and aligns with His perfect character. 1 John 1.5, for instance, says that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. Or Deuteronomy 32.4 says the rock Speaking of God, His work is perfect, for all His ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is He. God can do no wrong. Some theologians actually say that the scariest truth, the most disturbing truth, 
the most upsetting truth in all of Scripture is that God is good. Is that God is good. Why? Why would that be? Why would that be so disturbing or upsetting that God is good? Because if God is good, what will he do with us? If God is truly good and just all the time and in every way, what will he do with traitors and sinners and transgressors like you and me who have sinned against him and broken his law and rebelled against him? If God is truly good and just, then he has to punish sin and judge sin. He cannot turn a blind eye to evil. We do this every day, don't we? We become desensitized. We turn our eyes from it all the time, even as we ourselves commit it. But if God is God and is truly good, he cannot and will not. If God is to make a way, therefore, because of his goodness, if he's to make a way for us to be saved, it has to be a way where our sin is not just swept under the cosmic rug. And he says, oh, I'm just going to ignore all of that. Wave a magic wand, suddenly ignore all the sin. No. It has to be a way where sin is punished and where God's perfect and good and just character is preserved. What this means is that rebels like you and me are not smuggled in right through a hole in the fence in the backyard of heaven, right? Kind of, We're not coming in the, in the front door. God's making a deal. He's cutting a hole in the fence way back in some field where nobody is and he's going to sneak us in in some kind of an e evil and shady and underhanded, insidious way. No. If lawbreakers like you and me are to get into heaven, it will be through the front door. And it will be because somehow we are worthy to stand in his awesome presence. Because God is good, there will be no underhanded deals happening on his watch to get people into heaven. So God's goodness makes perfect sense of the gospel in an absolutely stunning turn of events. Jesus offers his own obedience in exchange for our disobedience. And he takes upon himself the chastisement and the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins. He offered up his own body to be crucified and to endure the anger and the wrath of Almighty God towards sin. And he did it to the point of death. As it says in our text for this morning in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ was crucified as the scriptures foretold and he was buried. He died. Why is it important to note that Christ was buried, that, that he went through this to the point of death? Because burial was the proof that Christ was dead, right? His execution was public. His burial was public. He was completely dead. He wasn't left partially wounded up on the cross. He was dead and buried. And because he endured that terrible fate, you and I don't have to. We are shown grace. So the offense, the, the problem between us and God has been removed. We may receive pardon. But what if Christ remained in the grave? You and I would still be dead in sin. Our debt would be paid, but we, like Jesus, still in the grave, would still act life. And later on in the same chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this. Listen to this. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even, even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But because Christ was raised from the dead, we too will be raised, folks. 
if God has not raised Christ from the dead, it would call into question all that Jesus did. Because since he, but because since he was raised, we have confidence that God has given his amen to all that Jesus did. Now why does Paul mention in verse 5 that Jesus appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve? Well, because here again, Paul is giving us a proof to the historical fact that Jesus was raised from the dead by, by God. At the time and place this was written, many of those, those people who saw Jesus would have still been alive. You could go and ask them, did Jesus appear to you? Right? They were eyewitnesses. You could go talk to them. Yeah, Bob down the road, Jesus appeared to him. And you could go and ask them, did that happen? Is this a true story? One surefire way to put this whole Jesus fanaticism to rest would have been to produce the body, right? To say, oh, no, he didn't rise. Here's his body, right? His, his flesh. Or to go talk to these people and see if, if what Paul's saying is true, right? Did he actually appear to you? Did you see him? Did you see the Lord? So Paul mentions the post-mortem appearances here as proof of Christ's historical resurrection, just as his burial was proof of his death. And because Christ was raised, we too will be raised. And because God gave the final stamp of approval upon the life and the work of the Lord Jesus in raising him, we too shall receive that stamp of approval. Because through faith in Jesus, his obedience becomes ours. We are clothed in the very goodness of God himself. So when we stand in the presence of God on that great day, He doesn't see our record of wrongs. He doesn't see our filth and our baggage and our rags. He doesn't see that. All He sees is the perfect, spotless record of the Lord Jesus who lived a perfect life of obedience for us and credited it to our account. In this way, God's own integrity and goodness and honor are preserved. There's no smuggling sinners in the back fence, right? Into the kingdom of God. They enter with their sin debt paid in full and with the perfect record of Jesus Christ in their account. Hallelujah. Well, what does this mean for you and me? What it means is that everything you need to be saved has been accomplished by God already through the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is what makes the gospel such incredible news. All you must do is receive it. Cease your striving to save yourself. Cease striving. Stop all your self-help and religion and all the things you're trying to do to pull yourself up out of the pit. Stop trying to dig yourself out of the pit that you put yourself in in the first place, right? Let God be all. Let God do all. Believe the good news of Jesus and be saved. And as you begin to believe this gospel, that's what I've just preached to you is the good news and the gospel of Jesus. As Kathy shared in the children's message, you will be changed. It will change you. You will be different. Like in the story of Ezekiel that we heard earlier in the, in the service that, that Carol read for us. Those dead and dry bones will come to life. As the Lord says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put, with, I will put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You will no longer be dead. You will be alive because he lives. You will live. As this next song says to us so powerfully, we will live because he is our living hope. He is not a dead hope, a God in the grave. He is alive. He is risen. And because He is risen, we too will rise. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to invite...
Jim and Carol come forwards and get ready to sing for us. I'm just going to pray as they come come up. I'm going to pray that uh, God would move in our hearts now. So let's pray. God, we uh, we just thank you so much for this good news. We thank you that um, all we must do uh, is receive it and believe it and, and 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 believe what you've said that this is you will do this that you have done all for us. You have accomplished salvation for us you have lived and died and and risen again for us and our part is to just yield to that truth and believe it and when we do we are saved and we are different we are changed so god i pray that there would be some new hearts out there today many of us know this good news and rejoice in this good news already god i pray that that we would see new people come into the kingdom and be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus and rejoice in the goodness of God. Bless us now as we sing. Be glorified. We love you and we thank you that you are our living hope. Amen. Hopeless? Hopeless? No! Hope! Oh, Ciao! How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of
Amen. Praise God. What a joy to rejoice in this good news. This good news is not something that gets old or, or grows trite. It's always good news. We praise God for it today. In the midst of a world where that is filled with bad news, we know good news, and his name is Jesus. I invite you to stand as we conclude our service now, if you're able, and receive the Lord's blessing. Actually, I'm going to extinguish the candle, and then we'll do the blessing. Receive the blessing. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless all of you. You may go in peace. Thank you for being here this morning.